are the director of the Summit County Library. I'd like to welcome you all to our final program for this year's Summit Reads. This is our fifth year of having Summit Reads, when we ask you, as many as want, to join us in reading the same book and then get together and discuss uh, the topics and share our reactions to the, the books that we've had read. We started off the first year with The Omnivore's Dilemma when we were first starting our community gardens and started talking about local food and that whole movement. And then the next year, the lovely Dave Coop came to me after a book discussion and he says, I've been reading all these books about fire. And I thought, what a great topic. We've got all these dead trees all over here in Summit County. Maybe we ought to have a, a discussion about what would we do if we had a big fire here in the county and where would we go and how, what would we do with our animals and stuff. So we paired up with the fire districts that year and they brought their wildfire equipment to our book discussions and people got to learn about how they fight wildfires and we had uh, the emergency services director talk about how one would evacuate from the county if we had a bad fire. And we had animal control there to tell you what to do with your animals, and it really was very successful. We had a lot of people come to that one. And then the next year, we got to thinking, what other issues do we have here? And water came to mind. And this year, we have lots of water, but that year, we had a drought going on. So it was the perfect time to have a conversation about water. And so we picked the book, The Blue Revolution, and that was the first time we actually had one of the authors come. Her name is Cynthia Barnett, and she came from Florida. And she actually talked to her local people, because the book that she wrote does research about water issues all across the United States and all around the world, in Australia and India and Africa, so that she was trying to get it to be more localized. And we also had people representing the local water people coming and talking about how the desert reservoir works and how it goes to Denver and how the Colorado River is all parceled out and you know, we don't get to keep hardly any of the water here. It's got to go downriver to all those other people. And then the next year, we decided we would do uh, something about sustainability. And we also started the Seed Library last year. We did the book Getting Green Done, and Audie Schendler, who wrote it, is the sustainability director at the Aspen Ski Company. And so he came over and started talking about what the local ski areas are doing to help counteract global warming and to hopefully keep snow around for the future so that we can continue to have our resort community here in Summit County and in, over in Picking County. And, up in Lake County and all around here in the mountains. And uh, so then we thought, well, what can we do next? And then we thought, well, you know, technology is a big deal in our lives. It's a big deal for me at the library, for sure. And it's a big deal, I think, in every single one of your lives as well. And so we found the book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Your Brain. And we thought, well, here's a nice readable book that talks about how technology has been changing over the years and what the internet has really started to do to various people, and how it's changing how they think, and how their minds work, and let's have everybody try to read that, and then have a discussion about how it's affecting different parts of people here in the county. So tonight we've got a, a panel here representing various different aspects of people's lives here in the county. Um, I'll let Dave go ahead and introduce everybody. Dave is going to be our moderator tonight. Dave is the uh, water foreman for the town of Frisco, but in his prior life, he was also the mayor of Silverthorne. So he's had a lot of different, various interactions with the internet in various different ways as well. And he was very interested in this topic, and so he agreed to, he actually led a book discussion for us earlier, and so he agreed to moderate the panel tonight. So the idea is that each of these people will talk for 10 minutes thereabouts about what their reactions are to the book and what's happening with the internet in their own lives, professionally and personally. And then we'll open it up to all of you to ask questions or offer your own opinions about what you had as a reaction to the book or what you thought about what the internet's doing to your brain. So thank you, Joyce. Thanks, Joyce. i got to stroll over here for a second. I apologize for walking in front of everybody. But uh, I read this three or four years ago. And it just, you know, it, it kind of appealed to me. As Joyce said, I had this real Dr. Jeff and Mr. Hyde thing when I was the water foreman for Frisco, which nobody knows where their water comes from and how it gets there, it just comes out of the faucet. So I had a job where really nobody knew what I did. And then at the same time, I was a mayor, which everybody knew what I did. You know, and if they didn't, they could read about it in the daily. So it, it was a, in those two areas, I was dealing with people constantly. And I was constantly amazed at the change I was seeing. Um, I was in Silverthorne for quite a long time. Well, I, I still live there, but I'm in government, and it was 18 years. So I had a broad span of kind of watching this evolution 
civility and just the thought process. And uh, and I thought I was I thought I was crazy. I thought I was just getting older and getting less tolerant. But I just saw it in too many areas. I saw it in kids. I saw it in in, in teens. I saw it in adults. I saw it in seniors. And and it's not an issue of good or bad. It's just an issue of change. And I was trying to figure out where the change was coming from because I had to deal with it constantly. And you know, you just can't use old methods on new problems. So I thought I was nuts, basically. But that's why I walked over here to get this. This is when the author came, and this guy is as normal as can be. I, I mean, it was refreshing talking to this gentleman because he was he was a breath of fresh air. And uh, and I asked if he'd sign my book, and he says, for Dave, you are not nuts. So I just wanted to publicly show him. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, I'm, I'm not crazy. You know, there is a change going on. And uh, the panel tonight, you know, enough about me. The panel tonight has all different aspects, all different uh, careers uh, that, they, that they can draw from their experience from and their observations. And uh, at this point, I'm just going to go back into the traffic cop mode and let the panel speak for themselves. But if we could start with you, and please introduce yourself and just, just a little bit about you and why you're here. We'll get through introductions, and then and then I'll give you a break, and we'll start at the other end and uh, and, and just uh, give the observations. So, okay, thank you. I'm Kayla Severwall, and I'm a senior at Summit High School. I'm here mostly to provide the perspective of someone who's grown up with the internet, um, and to kind of, I don't know, give a young person's perspective on how it's been to have this new technology shape my mind as I've, as I've grown up. Hi, I'm Carol Gerard. I'm a newly retired psychologist, um, thankfully. Not a moment too soon. Um, I've worked for over 40 years in the mental health field, um, and I got kind of tired last year, so I stopped working. It's been wonderful. And I'm here because Karen Berg from Next Page asked me to come, and I love Karen, and I can't say no to her. So. <laughs> you think that a degree in electrical engineering would help in these instances? <laughs> I moved to uh, Summit County 35 years ago, and I'm here representing the seniors. And work with the seniors at the Senior Center in the uh, computer concierge, where we work with people that are having computer problems. And I don't see that the problems that the seniors are having are any different than the other people I work with. It's just that they're more worried about it. Uh, Dave, tell me your name. Huh? Oh, I'm Dave Bittner. Uh, I'm a real estate broker now, but I've had uh, a variety of careers. But uh, that's how I got here, and hopefully we can talk about uh, what the, what's happening to all the people in our community. I'm Elizabeth Lowe, and I was asked to speak um, primarily for my professional role. I work as the Summit County Head Start Director, so we serve... Um, children prenatal up to age five from low-income families in Summit County through preschool programming in the school district. Um, we've got some children at Summit County Preschool. And then we also serve children prenatal up to age two via home visitation in partnership with the FERC. And then we have um, some kids also at Summit County Preschool. So I'll address what, um, what I'm seeing in kind of those early years and then just the, my personal life, I'm a mother of two children in the school district. I have a 10-year-old who is in fourth grade in Illinois Valley and a 14-year-old who is in eighth grade at the middle school. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Andy Shaneman, and I've been teaching at Colorado Mountain College for the last 15 years. My subjects are... Well, mainly philosophy, but I also teach a little literature and, uh, and history. And uh, you, those of you who have my handout, uh, I take this opportunity un unashamedly to promote my course next fall in existential literature and philosophy. 
So those of you here who are so intellectually interested in this subject, you know, I invite you to enroll for my course. Um, I don't know what to say. I've, uh, like Dave, I've had many careers up here. I taught skiing for many years. But when I came out west to teach skiing, I brought my library with me. I've always been a, a reader, and a better reader than skier. <laughs> Um, I guess that's enough. Okay, panel, thanks. Um, Andy, why don't you hang on to that? And let's just start with your observations of, you know, what you've seen, you know, tr more or less on the subject of the book, you know, just the change in thinking, the change in habits, um, how it's affected you personally, yourself, how you've seen it affect maybe your students, um, just what have you seen over time? I am a late adapter, and uh, I was born under a different star where technology just gives me loads of problems. I, I have a MacBook that I haven't conquered yet. At the school, I'm forced to uh, use the Internet. I have to confess, I do like Amazon. <laughs> Sorry for the local merchants, they don't like to hear that. But what I've noticed in the classroom is, is rather disturbing. And I think maybe uh, some of the older people in the audience will, will commiserate with me. But uh, there was a day when in high school we would read the classics. And we would read Brave New World and 1984 and Shakespeare. We would leave Shakespeare, uh, a, a high school with at least a couple of Shakespeare plays. And when I asked my class, you know, about their reading, they offer what they've seen on television. They offer what, the, oh, what they've heard on TED Talks. But I think what most concerns me is that literature seems to be leaving the, uh, our culture, especially among young people. And I think uh, Nicholas uh, Carr uh, touched on this in his book, didn't he? But uh, I want to read something by Emerson. Are you all familiar with Ralph Waldo Emerson? Yes. The Transcendental Philosopher. He said, the use of literature is to afford us a platform whence we may command a view of our present life, a purchase by which we may move it. And I'm afraid our younger generation is missing this by by virtue of just being on multiple screens all of the time. I don't know, is there any feedback on this? Kaylee, what do you think about this with your peers? Um, I think I can certainly see the distraction element because you everything is on one device, so it's easy to switch between tasks all the time and to think you're being productive when you're really just doing a couple you're doing several things at once without really focusing on anything. But I don't think that we're necessarily losing an appreciation of literature. I can only speak for some of high school, but that's the only place I've been. But we do read, I think I've read like three or four Shakespeare plays in my English classes over the four years. Um, and we studied Emerson in sophomore year. Um, and I think... There's hope. Thank you. <laughs> Was I being too negative, do you think? <laughs>
Um, you can find all kinds of recommendations for children over to um, anywhere from less than 30 minutes a week to no more than two hours a day. And so screen time would be that passive, um, whether it's TV, um, an iPad, a computer, etc. Um, and there's different reasons that people um, want to monitor that. There's certainly the health reasons. So folks who are working to combat childhood obesity obviously don't want kids sitting around um, not being active and playing. Um, there's concerns about um, disruptive sleep. There's concerns about behavior, behavioral um, problems. So there's mixed research on that. Um, and certainly, um, I think most early childhood educators that you would speak to, um, their biggest concern would be that children are not playing and they're not engaging in social interactions. So that's really critical for um, really birth to five, and I would probably argue above five, but for my, my group, um, infants are certainly hardwired to search out faces. They learn language by watching um, your face. They learn um, social skills. They learn to be empathetic. That's like they are looking for faces. So, if, um, and you'll see there's books out on baby, you know, just faces, because that's really important to um, brain development. So, any parents that are wondering if getting kids on screens earlier is going to be more educational, I would say no, just play with your child, be with your child, um, attend to your child. So that's really important. Um, I actually spent the day, um, I was down in Denver, and the school district early childhood coordinator and I worked pretty closely together. We were having this conversation about technology in the classroom, and, um, and we were like, oh, we probably need to have some more discussions um, with teachers. I think there's the defining technology. So people, you know, jump quickly to computers and iPads. But there's also, there's cameras, there's videotapes, there's Skyping. Um, so there certainly can be um, a wide variety of technologies that might be appropriate in a preschool classroom. Um, I think what's really important if you're looking at a preschool setting or a child care setting is the importance of having really qualified staff that are current on the latest research. So like anything, you know, in five years we might know more. <laughs> but right now, everybody's, um, like the NAUIC, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, their position statement really um, offers a balanced approach. There's going to be some benefits in a classroom. Um, if children are playing in the block area, and someone wants to build a castle, that might be an appropriate time for the teacher to pull out an iPad and look up a couple different castles um, to give them a visual to um, create from. Um, so that, that would be really capitalizing on those teachable moments. And that's what we want to see in preschool. We want to look for children's interests, and we want to expand upon that. So if technology is expanding their thinking, and it's expanding those social interactions, then I think it's really positive. If a child um, is sitting alone on an iPad playing on an app, that may not be the best use of time. Um, from a parent perspective, uh, I really I have little to no judgment because it's really hard. And I say often, I'm glad my kids are older and I didn't have an uh, iPhone <laughs> when they were little because I know I am on it more than I should be. Um, my son's 14. And when he was little, that was the time um, the Baby Einstein DVDs were out. And even at the time, I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't let him watch TV. But people would give them to you. That was like a really popular gift when he was little. And as a parent, having 20 minutes to chill out was awesome. So I think, you know, if parents need a mental health break and that's something that is going to happen, I think it's just important to be really intentional and aware. Um, you don't want to be doing that all the time. You want to be very aware of your use. Um, technology, again, the um, recommendations are that adults are engaging with the technology. I was at a restaurant the other night, and um, at the table next to us, there was a family, and they had three young children, and they were taking um, pictures with their phone and laughing, and that 
and again, I was thinking about this panel and um, technology, and I, I said, well, that seems pretty appropriate. Like, they were having fun together. They were looking at the pictures. They were talking about it. So it wasn't the, because sometimes at restaurants you will see kids with earphones on an iPad completely out of the conversation, and that, that concerns me. Um, again, I just, I just think computers will never replace the need for um, human and social interactions. The best thing parents and teachers can do is get down on the floor and play with children, um, ask questions, and take a sincere interest in what's going on with them. Um, and there are, you know, there's benefits for the teachers. So again, the adults I work with, I see technology has really changed a lot how our professionals are working in early, ch early childhood classrooms. Um, the assessment program that we use program why with home visitors and teachers birth of tier five is called teaching strategies gold it's an online based as, um, assessment teachers enter in observations and then they um, have three checkpoints a year so they can um, kind of track development based on where a child should be um, developmentally and they can pull really quick reports so that can inform their teaching and they can make um, changes to their planning and lessons, and that's really a positive. And I also think a positive is communication between teachers and families. Um, a lot of the families that I work with um, text. So if we're going to have a parent event tomorrow and we send out a mass text, that's a lot more effective than um, sending something out in the mail or trying to call parents. Um, so that's really been a good success for us. And um, Again, working with children that are dual language learners, um, being able to access materials in other languages is a benefit. And again, Skyping. Um, not too long ago, we had a child who was um, down in children's, um, who was ill, and his class was able to Skype with him. And I thought, that's awesome. I mean, again, it was very um, appropriate. It was time timely. It was building that relationship. Um, so. I think it's a mixed bag, and I just think parents and professionals um, need to be intentional about their use. And as a parent, and I'll stop soon, um, <laughs> as a parent, it's tricky because, um, so my 14-year-old, I'll walk in, the TV's on, his laptop's on, and his phone's on, I'm like, oh my gosh, one screen. Like, you know, I, you know it's, it's balancing the screens, not even like the two hours. So I have initiated a blackout um, period from 6 to 8. I would bet you my husband and son are both on their phones right now. Um, so that's been mildly successful in terms of its effectiveness. But um, I've been really impressed with my son's, um, we were talking before the panel, um, like his skills as far as communicate. I feel like he's a good communicator, he's a good writer. He did a research project not too long ago and Actually, the assignment was, I don't think they could use any internet sources. They had to use books. And one of the challenges he found, they could find books online. Um, and I was like, you know, you can get books at the library, too. And um, He's like, oh, my gosh, using a book is so much easier than looking at a book online because, you know, like finding the page numbers and getting back to what you wanted. Um, so I thought that was, that was an interesting kind of aha for him. And um, same is true for my daughter who's in fourth grade. She has homework um, on, the, on the internet every night. Um, it's called Edmodo. And her teachers have made really funny videos. Um, mostly it's about math. So they watch it um, the night before. Um, and they have to do a little question on the, the internet for homework. So, so that's, that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I teach a class at the senior center, and it's computer one, not one on one. <laughs> I, 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 the, the mouse has two buttons. That's where we start. And I've been teaching this about three years now. But what I'm discovering is the attendance has dropped off because now. They know how to use a mouse. They know how to access the internet. I'm running out of people to teach because seniors are using computers all the time. 
Um, I teach, um, I sell real estate. All our contracts are internet based. So, somebody selling a house and they're in Springfield, Illinois, no problem. Forget the facts. Forget sending overnight deliveries. God, what a waste of money that was. But they all have a computer, it all has Adobe Acrobat. We send them a link. They go down to the bottom. I have to talk them through the first time doing a digital signature. But when they see it, they're excited. And I'm finding that there's widespread adoption. And they're telling me that to stay in touch with their families, they have to know how to use the basics. You know, email, Yahoo, you know, do a search. Uh, they're coming back to the senior group, which is the computer concierge, and every other Monday, you can bring your computer. Now they all bring their own computers. They all have laptops. And they can, now they want to know about Skype, they want to know about picture management, they uh, bring in their uh, notepads, and they're having you know, some, some technical issue, and we have folks that help, help them out. But they're very knowledgeable. I find that the, the public in general uh, is very knowledgeable. I don't, can't remember the last time I sent somebody a contract via the internet that they said, oh, what is this? You know, they're past that. They're, it's a tool for them. And really have adapted well. Now, is their focus any less good? Well, I think, it, you know, you get to be 70, 80, your focus kind of fades, uh, you know, without the internet. But they use it as a tool. And I think that we're all learning to do that. You know, use it on our terms. Uh, I'm an early adapter. I've been on the internet since 1990, when it was all text, and we were using AOL and um, dial-up, CompuServe is where I started, and you know, got a browser as soon as it was available. Uh, you see all this gray here? <laughs> that's that's the technical life I've lived. I've been on the leading edge of technology most of my adult life. Um, it's not any easier for me than it is for anybody else. You just have to beat your way through it. Um, but the seniors are doing well with it. Maybe I'm not doing so well, but uh, we'll get through this. I found, I found the book to be very, very interesting. I liked how they, he talked about going from the Gutenberg uh, printing press, changing everything, and then the changes coming in with television and radios and all these other technological things too. Digital cameras, what a big change that has been for all of us. And I think in general, a very positive one. I think people take many, many more pictures. Now we just have to teach them how to find them again. <laughs> but uh, I think that the, the, this change is good. And I don't find that the lack of focus one thing to another is really cutting my productivity down. When I need to focus, I just focus in on it. And, um, you know, go play and follow all the links at some other time. Now, the book, I read it on a Kindle. I'm just really grateful I did. This guy has got a vocabulary that's amazing. <laughs> I've never read a book lately that had so many words that I'd never seen before, nor could I guess at their meaning. But on my Kindle, I just hold my finger on the word, and the definition pops up. You know, it doesn't distract me. I'd have to go to the dictionary to be able to sit and read this book. We're having a garage sale this weekend. I'm selling my dictionary. I know, I, we haven't used it in years. I've got one on my phone. The Kindle has one built into it. A book is no longer necessary for it specific things like that. It does a much better job. So, I embrace technology and yes, it's changing us. I worry more about the, the younger people that are, I see, overusing it. But you know, a lot of these things go in cycles. And I think it's going to work itself out just fine. I thought I was going to be the only one um, committing Summit County Book Group heresy. <laughs> so, I'm glad you started, Andy. 
Um, I find great use for the internet and uh, digital games um, as a clinical child psychologist and as a school psychologist. Spent many hours trying to get children on the autism spectrum disorder to talk to me. And lo and behold, when you show them faces on an iPad, they can start pointing to feelings and different people and they can pick out various details that they could not, at least yet, on a human face. So I, I think we have a long, um, a good uh, prognosis, I think, for the internet for um, very young children, not as young as two, Elizabeth, um, <laughs> for, for at least school-age children. Um, and then as a, a psychotherapist, um, I did a lot of working around the blackout area, particularly around dinner, um, because I think it's too easy to sit down and mm -hmm. while you're cutting your meatloaf with one hand, tapping on your um, iPhone with the other. So I did a lot of work in that area. I have a colleague, um, and I can't claim this um, technique, but I have a colleague who works here in town, and she actually uses side-by-side -side texting with her child clients who are either um, nonverbal or hesitant about talking to a stranger. So she uses that just right next to the child. And lo and behold, after a while, we start talking with her. So um, I, I thought that was brilliant. I wish I could claim it, but I can't. Um, I also have spent time um, in staffings with parents in special education. While we're sitting in the staffing, we can actually look up various things that might be helpful for their child right then and there. Because we all know what happens when we get home. We forget about it. We you know, there are other things, 39 other things to do. So I am a fan. And from a personal standpoint, um, I want to know when your class is and how old you have to be <laughs> first. But I spent an afternoon um, on Sunday with four, um, probably four of your classmates. And they all had their phones. And we had a particular discussion that we were um, engaged in. And the phones kind of were just extra tools for them. They'd be on the phone, and then they'd show somebody, you know, a text, and then they'd be back in the discussion, in and out and in and out. It was perfectly well integrated. I didn't have to say, shake your phone off, like, you know, some cranky old adult, which we all can be. So um, I'm happy um, that we have these tools. I think they've really extended um, what we can do for children and what we can do for families, particularly children. I didn't forget to mention this. Um, on the autism spectrum disorder, we really have had some good, um, some good luck. And when we get back around to it, I have some um, research that I want to talk about um, that has come out since Nicholas Carr published his book. That really is quite, quite hopeful about children with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and also older adults, 60 to 85, which I think a few of you might fit into that category. So I'll come back to that. I really appreciate what both of you have said about um, technology being a tool, and I think it might be interesting, I don't know if you know, but our graduation speaker on Saturday is a gentleman from MIT who has been working on um, technology to help AF, um, ASD kids, autism, so kids with autism interact with their parents. Um, and I think I really like the internet and I really like technology, and I think that's not only a product of having grown up with it, I think it really can be a valuable tool. For me, it's mostly about community building. Um, I think some of you might have heard that there was a tragedy at some high school this week, and I think for our class, a lot of what has been helpful to us is the internet, because a lot of us have been up on Facebook at night talking about memorial services and things we can do to remember our classmate and, um, and exchanging memories and just providing support, which I think can be really valuable when you're in a situation where you can't always get together all the time. Um, and it's definitely brought our class closer and helped us deal with this um, tragedy. And um, I also think the internet is, can actually be a positive thing when it comes to education, and I can't speak to younger kids um, because I wasn't really on the internet at that age, but um, I think for me, it really provides a helpful resource for studying, and especially for primary sources. This year I'm in history class that's studying the Cold War, and we've read primary sources like transcripts between of conversations between Kissinger and Khrushchev that if I'd been a student in the 70s, I wouldn't have even known they existed. Um, so I think that it can be really um, a 
valuable way for people, especially people without access to a good public school, to still get a good education. Um, you might have heard of Khan Academy. It was started by someone who wanted to um, teach his niece, his niece algebra, so he uploaded a bunch of YouTube videos explaining concepts to her, and the company just exploded, and now it's basically an online school where you can take tests and watch videos, and so that's used a lot for kids who don't necessarily have access to the best of educations. Um, and that's not to say the technology doesn't have its bad points, and I know for sure that it can be a waste of time, but I think the important thing is that it's a tool like anything else, and we can, um, we can manage our use of it, and our children's use of it, to make sure that we control it and it doesn't control us. Um, as far as the book goes, I really enjoyed reading it. I thought it was very interesting. Um, I thought his conclusions were really well supported, but I was, I was kind of not sure about his premise because I don't know if reading, if the kind of, the kind of reading that Nicholas Carr seems to value, um, as in like the deep focused reading that you get when you're reading a novel or something, is necessarily what we want out of our media. I think there are different things. I think we need to define what we expect from our media and to define what kind of intellectual society we want to build. And I think that books are good for some aspects of that, and the internet is good for others. Um, I also found the book to be, I don't know, a little bit cynical about the effect of technology. Because on the back it says, silent spring for the literary mind. And I think, I don't know if I would compare it to like environmental destruction. Silent spring is a book by Rachel Carson about the, um, about like harmful chemicals in the environment. And I don't know that I would compare the advent of the internet to environmental destruction because I feel like it's a shift in the way we think, but not an end to humans thinking and to students learning. And I think it's just something that we need to adapt to when you learn to use. Thank you. Hang on a second. Um, I just have a question. I, I told you you wouldn't be our sacrificial young person, but <laughs> you lied. Yeah, no, 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 really. Um, by the by the by the age, by the demographic here, we all have the luxury of comparison. You know, most of us were brought up way before the internet. <laughs> you know, TV was in its infancy for some of us. Um, you know, so we've been through a couple of these evolutions, and and you're right. And somebody brought it up. It's not the end of the world. You, you know, I mean. Everybody claims it will be, and then life goes on. Um, but I'm I'm concerned about, with the sake of comparison, we all we all can look at the new and pick and choose, you know. And and what if that's the only option, you know, for for younger children? And, and that's and and I don't. Once again, it's I'm I'm not judging. It's not a good or a bad, but it's just an observation. Is that we've had different backgrounds, we've had different lives, we've had different education, um, and uh, what, what am I saying, personal, inter you know, eyeball to eyeball, FaceTime, you know, whatever you want to call it now. What happens when that's being taken away? Helen, your your niece has brought it up at the, you know, where their classes, their syllabus start. Oh, Karen, I'm sorry. Karen, uh, the, uh, the syllabus was online. The, the course book was online. The test was online. And, and that kind of... I, I never had anything like that. Have you? you know, see, I'm out of my realm here. That's kind of why... It, it's a, I'm, I'm glad we have this panel here with this cross-section of knowledge. But, but basically, we're a product of our environment, and our environment goes back quite a ways. And what happens if you're just starting out in this realm? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think my generation is still the transition generation, like you were saying about like sleep loss with kids um, mm -hmm. having access to technology at night. Um, when I was little, it was still mostly sleep loss because I was reading under the covers. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've got a little cousin who's I think nine or ten years old now, and he he's on his iPad a lot, and he always wants to be playing on my phone. And that doesn't mean that we don't play with him. Um, he still likes running around with the dogs and playing like playing pretend. But I think that once things once everything starts to be on the on the internet and on the computer it could I think the generation who's on the internet right now like we're like five and six are gonna grow up to be pretty different than 
um, people my age, and I think, but again, I think it really depends on how we use it. Like, I've used Edmodo in the past, and um, it's basically Facebook for education. So you have a profile, and you post assignments, and teachers grade it, and you can rate how you felt about the assignment, and you can see videos. And I think that that can be a really good place for discussion, because I think people tend to think of technology as kind of isolating, and you're just doing your own thing, but it's also a tool for connection. And so I think intellectual discussions do happen um, within technology, and I think that people can really become immersed in their subjects without um, using only books. And well, thank you. I think we've had far too much optimism here. If we could, <laughs> if we could get back, <laughs> could we get back to my negativity? And um, for those of, for those of you, oh, do I need this? Yes. Technology. Yep. All right. <laughs> um, for those of you who picked up my handout, and I wrote this. This doesn't apply to the others, but. Um, there is a psychological study at the University of Virginia, and it found that human beings struggle to avoid situations where they are left to their own thoughts. Now, I think we all need this solitude, this quiet time, where we can engage in a kind of reflective activity. And I teach philosophy. I think. I think this is necessary to form our own individual identities. And I'm afraid that this is a, a disappearing from our culture. If I could go to my exhibit. Can you all hear me? Can I take this? Is this better? All right. Um, this is a painting by Edward Hopper from 1927. And the young woman is sitting at this table, and uh, we have the ghostly lights above, but she's obviously in solitude and reflecting on her own thoughts. Now, if this were to be taking place today, this young woman in a different dress would have a cell phone in front of her, thereby negating this opportunity to connect with your innermost thoughts. I don't know, we have a psychologist here. To, what are your thoughts on this? I'm a great fan of multitasking. Um, and to take it down just a, a little bit different road, Andy, I think while reflection is important, some of those underlying cognitive abilities that Nicholas Carr feels like we're losing, I'm not so sure we are. Those underlying cognitive abilities like working memory, sustained attention are still with us, but we have to have those first in order to get to this reflective, introspective, looking inward and being self-observant. Um, if we don't have those basic underlying tools, we're not going to get there. So you're positing some kind of cognitive hierarchy? Yes. Before we can look at Yes. And Nicholas Carr would, would have us believe that we've lost all of that multitasking ability. And he does not he's not a great fan of multitasking anyway, um, because he thinks that makes us, I think superficial was one of his words, um, easily distracted and going down left turns, right turns, and not really getting to the point. Um, and I, I disagree. I think being able to multitask, those of us who are over 60, we've kind of lost that ability. Um, we tend to get distracted, and there are things we can do to keep that ability. Driving is a multitasking function. Cooking is a multitasking function. Sorry, I'm taking it away from you, but um, I feel like this is really pretty important that we maintain those abilities um, and keep those sharp. And there are internet um, interventions, um, research-based, evidence-based research um, that will allow us to do that. Um, newer newer kinds of things that um, I think would be very helpful. Excuse me for a second. Panel, how would you feel about opening it up and discussing with yourselves, among yourselves, folding the public in on this? Absolutely. Well, that right. works. Because yeah. I don't... Um, okay. This 
gentleman had a question. I told him to hold off for a second, but you know, I thought this is probably the time. It's getting a little open up here, so let's let's go with it. My name's Philip. I'm a scientist. I live in uh, uh, over in Clear Creek County. My question is to the philosopher in Nicholas Carr's subsequent book, uh, The Glass Cage. I haven't read that. I haven't read it yet. Um, he mentions Utopia, uh, Oscar Wilde, that people are giving given the luxury of not having to do manual labor so that they can turn inward and reflect on the meaning of their life and their identity. Yeah, it is utopia. It is a little bit too positive. Um, there was one quote, uh, and believe me, I, my, I was given the book to read, and he told me to look at the opportunity in this problem. I'm having a hard time looking at the opportunity. Um, there was one quote in a book recently called the uh, called the Rational Optimist, and they uh, considered the tool of the Stone Age man and how it became an unconscious decision. It became instinctual. That the stone tool became instinctual. Um, that that advance in our pursuit of our pursuit of economy gave us freed up our time to spend with our children. Um, and then on the other hand, a lot of the uh, naysayers uh, are arrogant, uh, condescending, and it's anti-labor. Um, that it's actually, as a scientist, I'm now just monitoring the mathematics going on in code, and I have no feedback, and it causes a lot of problems at work. So my question is, how do we address this philosophically because I think it is a wisdom. Uh, I, I do believe Emerson in being a naturalist um, to get back, but I don't believe in going all the way back to the caveman because I, I do believe going on forward that it is a tool. Um, so how would uh, your Oscar Wilde, how would they, how would the iRobot do this? How do you how do you get a robot that knows how to tell the difference between a child and an animal in a road and, and you're you're using Google? Um, how do you how do you stay engaged in this in this high tech without losing identity of ourselves? May I respond? Yeah. I would like to lead us back to the nineteenth century <laughs> and consider no well in my handout, I, I really um, I was impressed rereading Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. He wrote it in 1934, and he's reacting. He, he poses a dystopia, that is, a utopia that has gone wrong. And there were so many technologies that he was dealing with in this, in this brave new world. And the protagonist, the chief protagonist, was called the Savage because he was born on a reservation and he read Shakespeare and Orwell makes references to Shakespeare too that's just a, a nice value to read a literary value to return to but uh, anyway I, I think the problem is that we can't escape from these technologies and I think that affects our, our thinking. It doesn't really release us. I think in a, a great deal it imprisons us. How many here can escape this, uh, this uh, internet that is imposed upon all of our lives? I don't, I don't see this as, as a release, but... I, I see what you said, it's a tool. It's an incredible tool. It's a library at your fingertips. It's any information you'd ever want to see. But there has to be some kind of internal filtering as to what you are looking at and what you are reading and the weight of what you are reading. I mean, the trouble with the internet is that the Nobel laureate and the village idiot are number one and two as references. And unless you have somewhat of a grip about what you're looking for, it's a level playing field, and and it isn't a level playing field. You know, basically, life isn't a living a uh, level playing field. So, as you said, I I I'm kind of 
on your side of the scale here, I'm trying not to, you know, show my Luddite, you know, past, but... Um, More power to me. We got another comment. Okay, go ahead, Mel. I'm sorry, don't worry. I'm hearing all this and I see different parts. I have two elderly parents, one who travels the world playing tennis and stays active and has friends all over the world. She's very much into using the internet and it's, it's part of her world. I'd still like to get her to text. She's <laughs> for some reason, but still. And then I have another parent who is from your world, the intellectual world. He was a Fulbright scholar. He was a NASA scientist. He, he just is so proud of his big brain. But he struggles with the internet. And it's kept him old. And it's kept him out of touch. And you know, he, and it's like, with mindfulness, it's like I'm struggling with my phone. I use my phone to distract myself from my own thoughts. It's like, I'll play solitaire. Oh, I'll play Words of Friends again. And I'm, I'm, it's because I'm not comfortable with my own thoughts or feelings or whatever. It's like, it's a tool, but it is, it is something that you can put down. And living in Summit County going, it, living yeah. in Summit County and saying, how do we escape this internet? It's like, you've got trails to hike on. <laughs>
balancing act to me. I, I really don't know. You know, you can't go all one way or all the other. Um, yeah, and I see when you go one way or the other, then that's where the problems arise. Yeah, but I feel like this is like when TV first came out. Yeah. It had to be managed, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm at the generation where kids would read Mad, Mad, Mad Magazine all day, and their parents would have to manage that. And so I think it's just like with anything, that it needs to be managed by parents. If it's not managed by parents, it can become too much. I mean, I didn't have anyone managing my time, and so I watched Gilligan's Island, like, 24 hours a day, you know, whenever it was on the wall. And so... And you still you know, will, won't you? <laughs> so I, just think I just think it's a matter of, you know, us all as parents, and, and then, you know, the kids, you know, I didn't end up growing, you know, watching Gilgit's Island all day, I didn't, I went to college, I, you know, read the classics late, and, you know, I think it's just like any technology, like electricity first came out, people thought it was, you know, the devil, and it was going to change everything, I think it's just a matter of keeping things in the right place, you know? Huh? Oh, I know, right? <laughs>
know what Tumblr is, but it's a blog site where a lot of people use it for, like, as a way of expressing themselves, and they have this interaction with the community that they never see face to face. And I think by putting so much of themselves out there and then getting that instant response from people who wouldn't otherwise, they wouldn't otherwise tell those things to, that it makes people a lot more emotionally vulnerable. And I think that's where some of the, like, the suicides and the, the um, self-doubt come from. Is, is that commonly recognized? Is that putting yourself out? I mean, it's the, it's the internet. It's the World Wide Web. I mean, you know, there's some guy in Pakistan reading what you said. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, is that is that recognized? Because I'm not I'm not a hermit. I don't live under a rock. Or but I just it just amazes me that when you put this stuff out there, it's out there and it's out there forever. And I don't you know I've well there, there's been some <laughs> some interesting Facebook incidents through the years. You know if you're going to be an airline pilot, don't show drunken parties on your you know on your Facebook page. But you know just stuff like that 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 kind of still seems to be. Um, people are surprised by it, and I don't know. To me, it, 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 right from the start, that was that was the that was the allure of this is that you are wide open to everything. That was also the danger of this is you're wide open to everything. I don't know if I'm misunderstanding what Kaylee said, but <coughs> for centuries, humanity has kept diaries and written journals day by day in solitude that no one else sees and they reflect on it and it's a way of developing your, your own personal identity and I think it's I don't know rather frightening that if Kaylee is if that's what you meant that people are just want everybody to see what they're writing and uh, there's what, is this a dis disappearance of privacy? I think that's what I'm seeing. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm new to Tumblr specifically, but I think um, you just said that blogs are basically diaries, and I think it feels private, because it's not like you're gonna see someone who's read your diary, or that's gonna change their interactions with you, because their response to your thoughts is your only interaction. And so it feels like you're not telling anybody, and it feels like these people, the person on the other side of the screen isn't a real person, so I think, I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily a good thing. And I think a lot of positive things come from that as well, like a lot of discussions and a lot of support. But May I move again to the back corner? Yeah, you're getting me something that I'm really curious about as a speech pathologist who work with some of your kids. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the nonverbal aspects of communication that can be lost on the internet, especially in the kind of thing that you're talking about right now, that I wonder if it feeds into that bullying because somebody says something they don't have the opportunity to see the person's reaction to it. Um, I, I dwell heavily on interpersonal reaction in my communication, but how much of that do you feel is, is lost or different or coming about in a different way? Um, yeah, yeah, anybody. Anybody, okay, I'll, I'll try. And, um, I think the nonverbal pieces are really important, and, um, unless we're doing Skype or um, Right. What other thing? FaceTime, all those new stuff. Where you do get some nonverbal feedback. It's not perfect, um, but on a on a blog or on a some sort of a Tumblr um, <coughs> entry, yeah, you don't you don't know how that other person is receiving it. You also don't know the person receiving it also doesn't know how that person is sending it. Because right. you can okay. say how are you in many many snotty ways and many many nice ways. So there the. Possibility for misinterpretation certainly is there. I agree. I think that might add to the cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, the consequence, the immediate feedback is not. There. And it, it, I also think it makes um, one less responsible for their communication, the impact of their communication. If you don't see it, you don't see it yeah, right away. Yeah, it's certainly true. Good point. Well, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I've been facing the wrong direction. But I'm, I just wanted to say, well, it's like, I think just as humans are built, if you're going to read a long document, does it make sense to read it on a device, or is a book always, be like something that's, the I don't know what book that is right there, it, it's a little bit, but I, from I a scientific standpoint, like, like with me, it's like if I'm going to read anything of length, to me it feels easier to read it on paper, but I don't know what the studies are around that, you know, and 
and also it's like I think people are always yearn for physical contact and community. I don't think we're gonna I don't think we're gonna turn into a race where we're, we're only gonna ever want to look at devices. But I think it's like what you said, it's a tool that you choose to use and it's got its appropriate uses. We'll never get rid of books, Joyce. I hope not. <laughs> And I personally don't like to read them on an e-reader, but it has to do with, I spend all day looking at a screen. So when I get home at night, the last thing on earth I want to do is spend more time looking at a screen. So I want that book in my hand that's just, you know, there's no glare off of it. it just, I can put my bookmark in when I get done, I just set it aside and know it's going to be where I want it to be when I pick it up again. And that's just a personal preference. I buy tons of ebooks. We own 12,000 of them that you can go borrow from the library. So it's not like I'm against ebooks. I just don't personally want to read that way. And I don't see my life changing anytime soon. That I will. I understand why people travel and they like it because they can put all those books on that one device and take it with them. They don't have to have this stack of hardcovers with them or this stack of paperbacks with them. But to me, I pack the paperbacks to tell you the truth. I just want to have that book with me. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Dan Taylor. I'm a retired professor of classics and linguistics. So I'm a grammarian by definition, and grammarians look for mistakes. Okay. I don't have to go looking for them because they come to me. Uh, I, edit, I edited library columns for about three years for the summer day. Uh, when we moved out here, I promised my wife that I wouldn't write letters to the summer day with Denver, pointing out grammatical errors and, and stuff like that. But I will point out that, uh, and I must apologize, I haven't read the book because I've been out of the county and out of the country, uh, okay? But I'm looking forward to it because I'm very interested to, the, to this topic, what the internet is doing to our brains. I relate that to some of the mistakes. Some mistakes we no longer see because we now, we start out with spell check, and now we have autocorrect, which I, of course, hate because I'm writing an email and using Latin and Greek French, you know, all this other work, and it totally screws up my email name. So, um, but I can point out we're not getting the misspelled words, okay, that we used to see because everybody does do that. But putting it through spell check or autocorrect or whatever is not the same thing as proofreading and seeing to it that you've got it right, okay. So that our human, our brain still has to interact with that text whether it's on an electronic document or a page. We have to do that. And I will point out that I think the two best writers for the Summit Daily, I, I'm not going to excuse their names, but right before we left, within one week, they each committed the same mistake. And that is, for the past tense of the verb lead, they spelled it L-E-A-D, lead. I'm sorry, lead is it's the lead pipe, but... Colonel White in the bedroom or whatever, you know, Clue or something. It's, you know, and it's LED, it's not LED. They both make the same mistake. That's not a mistake. That's not a typographical error. Okay, that's a mistake made up in the brain. They didn't, they forgot their principal parts or whatever. Um, our ex sports editor still doesn't know the difference between the verb loathe and the adjective love. There's an E on the end of the verb. L-O-A-T-H is loathe, loathe as me. Those are mistakes that are made for the brain. I'm looking forward to reading this book and finding out what other things he says uh, that the computer is doing to our brains. Now, I'm also a textual critic and an editor. Um, so I'm looking at ancient manuscripts, thousand years old and stuff like that, trying to find mistakes in that manuscript so I can correct them and do stuff like that. <laughs> now, fortunately, your taxes and my research on stuff like that got us to Italy for three and a half years. Okay, we've lived in Italy for three and a half years. I spent hundreds of hours in beautiful libraries working with these manuscripts. If I were doing that same result, that uh, research that resulted in three books and dozens of articles, okay, I would never be going to Italy. Because those manuscripts are now avail available in digitized form. So I can look at a thousand year old manuscript. And you know what I can do with that? I can hit zoom. And I can see it clearer and see more in it than I could with my own naked eyes. So the internet, I think, the whole thing with the computer is probably.
probably the third greatest revolution in the history of linguistics, history of language and what we're doing with it. The first he mentions in here, I just got the book an hour and ten minutes ago, uh, but I quickly looked under Latin and the Greek and stuff like that. The first thing is when the Greeks uh, adopted the Phoenician alphabet, they, you, they used the symbols for consonants. Remember, so Semitic, Phoenician was a Semitic language, had no vowels, it just kept pointing. So, uh, the Greeks took all these consonants that they didn't have in their language and turned them into vowels. So that now you had, essentially, as he refers to it, phonetic language. So that was a major breakthrough. The Gutenberg Press is another one. He's got gobs of pages on Gutenberg. I'm interested to see what he says about that. Um, and I think the computer is number three. Uh, what we can do with it. But as you all mentioned, it's a tool. Okay? And the one problem that I have with the internet is that the quality of the information that is there, not so much the quantity, but the quality of it, it's only as good as the person who put it in. I hope you don't sell your dictionary, okay? And I hope it's an unabridged dictionary, okay? And the next time you read a book, count the number of words you've looked up, okay, and found out the meaning of, and two weeks later, see how many of those definitions you can remember. Because you're using it for a specific purpose. You're not trying to learn it meaning of the word, just trying to get on to the next sentence. So I think the computer is a great asset. Uh, and remember, I started my career before there was a computer at all. So my books were written long, but the secretary typed them up on her computer. So it's a different world. I was, just, I was just going to say, Dan, my, my dissertation was the first one to be typed on a word processor 30 years ago, and it was like this revolution, yeah. and the graduate school didn't trust it. Right. There was, there was right. a lady with a little rubber thing on her finger, and she went through page by page by page to make sure that it had all come, come out. Um, but I have some research I want to share, but I don't want to... Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Sure. Because I see gray hair and future gray hair. <laughs> no hair. <laughs> and, or, or that too big. Um, there's a company by the name of Achille, A-K-I-L-I, -A -I, that has just completed um, a series of uh, research studies that the F FDA has approved um, around having people practice cognitive skills with computer-based games, web-based games. Um, one of them is called NeuroCar, and you drive a car and do all this other stuff. But the studies are promising enough that two drug companies have invested in this little startup, which is a combination of game makers and uh, neuropsych folks that have, have come together to develop these games. And the, the drug companies are now onto this because they're thinking this is going to be a new medical device that may actually be patented. So to me, that was rather convincing if you have Pfizer and Shire putting money into um, some computer-based games that old people can play and seven-year-olds can play, not younger. So um, I, I, think that's, I think that's worth um, paying attention to. Um, and some of the things that the older people were citing and they found was that folks were better at remembering things and they could track conversations and they could concentrate longer than 30 seconds and remember somebody's name. Uh, those kinds of, you know, nice little skills that we all used to have that seem to be fading uh, into the woodwork. So that's my commercial. And I, I have no vested interest in Achilles. So. <laughs> <laughs> just, anybody? Just tag teaming on that in many years spent as a physical therapist. Um, we became a wonderful tool, you know, the the active right. game right. to be a wonderful right. rehab tool, and still is. It's it's used just, for particularly with neuro patients. Very good point. Yeah, so that's well, now what about the question of virtual versus actual? I mean, I used an example before of, of the Grand Canyon. There, there's a book out there called I think it's Last Child in the Woods. Yeah. It's a really interesting book. And uh, you know, if I was in the Forest Service, I'd seriously be doing some studying on this because you know if a, if a flyover of the Grand Canyon equates to a trip to the Grand Canyon you know does it um, 
depending on your well, I, yeah, it's depending on your age. I mean, I, I I have my biases, but I'm wondering because more and more of that is is surfacing, um, and, and the lines are blurring between virtual and and actual. I'll, I'll call it actual. I don't know if there's a better word for it, but uh, you know, I just I just wonder, you know, people's thoughts on that is uh, yeah, the, the basic. You know, here we live in the middle of national forests and that, and and, uh, and somebody mentioned, you know, going out and walking on trails, you know, and hiking, and then, and, and et cetera. But what happens when, when we we blurred the line into virtual and nobody's walking the trails anymore? You know, where does where does the funding for Old Faithful Lodge come from when everybody would rather watch it squirt on their laptop? Or people are playing Angry Birds instead of looking at our yeah, real birds. Yeah, yeah but the, the whole realm there, and, and that's that's kind of my concern, is, is that, once again, transitional, you know, as, as more and more options are leaving, and more and more screen time is showing up, and that becomes the norm, it, it really changes a lot of, well, it, it changes the system quite a bit. I was just going to say, in early childhood, there's been kind of, I mean, there's certainly a lot of grant opportunities to write for more nature experiences for young children. So, I mean, I think maybe that's kind of like the pendulum swinging, you know, like people recognize that kids need to be outside more, so you see a lot of that. Um, I think it was NPR, I was listening to the radio, and I, it was, um, they were saying a lot of Silicon Valley execs were sending their, did you hear that? sending their kids to Waldorf schools. And so Waldorf, if you're familiar um, with that, is a very, um, it's kind of a very pure um, educational philosophy in terms of like there wouldn't be computers, it'd be a lot of nature. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting. Certainly those kids are being exposed to technology in their home environment, but um, kind of that recognition they need maybe downtime or more simple space to um, to be in. I thought that was interesting. And I think with all this, there is kind of that, um, kind of the counter feelings to that. I, I go to this restorative yoga class, and they just added five more because so many people are coming. Um, I think people are looking for that space to not have any... Um, devices or electronics. So I mean, I think people are kind of searching that out in reaction to their busy lives. Um, and there's more and more, I think, recognition, whether it's children or adults, that you need that <coughs> quiet time and space. Um, I think, I don't think that virtual will ever completely replace actual. Um, like that cousin that I mentioned still loves to play in the snow as much as he loves to play on his iPad. Um, and I still read actual books. and. One thing that I think is interesting about that is that there's a demand for the actual within like virtual communities. Um, there's this conference every year called VidCon, which is where a bunch of YouTube video creators um, and fans all get together, and um, there are live shows and panel discussions, um, and they all stay in like a hotel and um, and basically talk about the process of video creation and the internet. And so I think that it's possible for those two to mesh without detracting from one another. Well, I find it interesting. I have a 32-year-old nephew whose whole world is he has a, a, a business called Computer Wizards, and he goes out and fixes people's computers and stuff. So now what does he do in his spare time? He used to play video games with his buddies. Now they get together to play board games. I find it fascinating that he's you know, gone away from all the online games, and he's gone back to playing games that we played when we were kids. You know, they're playing Scrabble. With a board, not with of friends on their phone like I've been doing. <laughs> and I think that's happening more and more that there's kind of this rebellion that's sort of going on. My fourth grader was just at a sleepover, and you know what they did? They played Monopoly. Oh, oh my gosh, the longest <laughs> game ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, they used to have, they put all their computers together in this basement of his oh, yeah. shop and they would play all these video games all night long. He did that for like, I don't know, five years or more. But all of a sudden, that's that's blase now. We're back to board games now. <laughs> so everything that's kind of goes in cycles, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I'll, I'll bring up one more. The, the physiological side of this, the brain plasticity that he brings up, the, the actual physical change of neurons, of uh, synapses, you know, all the routing, all the, all the biological stuff. Um, does anybody, I, I wiped out my shoulder a while ago skiing, being dumb, and it was in a sling forever. And I'm right-handed, it was my right arm. And to this day, I shampoo with my left hand. And I have no explanation for it other than I was forced to do it because this arm was in a baggie for six months. And I couldn't do anything with my left hand, but well, I don't have as much hair as I used to, but I mean, I still cannot shampoo right-handed anymore. And, and I found that really, really interesting that something changed. And he brings it up in the book quite a bit about a lot of the processes, you know, you're kind of hardwiring yourself, but you can also unwire yourself. And I don't know, thoughts on that? And I know I've kind of brought it in personal, but that, that, that just astounds me because, I mean, my left hand basically fills out the left glove when I buy a pair. That's, that's it, you know, and, and all of a sudden I'm just shampooing away like a pro, and I have no, you know, I mean, when I read this, I go, oh, that's what happened, you know, and, and uh, I, I'm worried about those changes. Raise your left arm. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll just say, yeah, then we will be fighting it out over the you know. <laughs> But no, is anybody, I mean, you know, I, I found that fascinating because I think that's what he was talking about is how it's changing. You know, there is actually, beyond societal, beyond opinion, beyond demographic, age, whatever, there may be physical changes going on. Well, I think he makes a good case for that in the book. Um, over and over and over yeah. again. Weighs heavily on it. Yeah, and and certainly the the research is convincing. But at the same time, we can also rewire our rewired brains. Um, we, we used to think that brain development stopped pretty much. Well, Marnie left. She would agree with me. I hope around 18 to 20. Um, and now we know that that continues and we can continue to grow brain tissue and connections throughout our probably our 80s and even our 90s. Um, but if, if all we do, I guess, is play video games and all of that, we're going to have some consequences from that. And I think pretty clearly we've been saying that we have to have a balance. Uh, but it sounds like your brain was very busy uh, while you were recovering and, and allowed you to, to, to really Use your left arm well, in a way you no, never had. You can't, after you can't feed yourself with your, yeah. Just, just yeah. Here. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just would like to say, um, so Kaylee's a senior and she's my daughter, and um, the, um, people are always talking about uh, this new generation and how they're not polite. I think you might have mentioned that before, or someone did, and, and they're not well read, and you know they don't communicate face to face well. And so we've just done the whole college tours and all that. And I, we looked at co the same college that I went to. And this generation, yeah. uh, I, it, none of us, we're all just jaw dropped at the level of um, respectfulness. And I'm just not seeing the, this negative you know, feeling. And it's across the board. You know, we saw very interactive kids, very well-read kids, very attentive, respectful. Um, in the same university that I went to, among all the other universities we went to, it was no different. I mean, certainly there are pockets, just like there were pockets when all of us were kids, of misbehaved kids, disrespectful kids, not well-read kids. But I, I actually see things getting better, not worse, mm -hmm. if a generation, if you can tell in a generation. I don't know what universities you were at, possibly elite universities. But some, but some were, some were you know, some, yeah, a, a few. There's a big difference at the community college level. Do you think there always was, though? Probably. Probably. Have you taught at other colleges besides CMC? I have not. Well, I think CMC is sort of unusual. Yeah. I've heard horror stories from the front range, however. Were they other community colleges? Or were they yes. older or? 
Go to DU and wander around. What's that? Go to DU and wander around and see if the. Uh, would they allow me on their campus? Yes, they would. <laughs> yes. With my negativity? <laughs> Go ahead, Meg. Well, I think it's funny um, that you said that you're a transition generation, because when I was coming tonight, I'm like, well, I'm 41. I'm kind of like that middle generation. <laughs> because I see myself, like, in the workplace, kind of being that middle person. Um, I work with some 20-year-olds, and, and I supervise some of them. I'm like, hey, in meetings, you got to put your cell phone away. Like, or, you know, limit your cell phone use. But I, it's just funny because as the kids come up, they're probably going to still think of themselves as a transitional generation because it's going to keep changing. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Ways we can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Anybody out there? Any more comments, questions, opinions? Then I would just thank you all for coming, and I appreciate the panel and their offerings of their experience. <laughs> so that we'll come around next year again, and so if you have any topics that you think would be interesting for us to try to find a book that would